Okay, I think, I think we'll get started now. Uh, I'm Eric Larson. I'm with the Energy Systems Analysis Group at the Anlinger Center here, and I'm going to introduce our speaker. Before I do that, just a couple reminders. This is the last highlight seminar for this semester, and next semester we'll be starting on February 20th with John Crittenden from Georgia Tech, and he's going to give a talk called Giga Technology Developing Sustainable Urban, Urban Infrastructure to Solve Gigaton Problems. We'll put that one on your calendar. Um, please silence your cell phones. And when we get to the Q&A afterwards, there'll be a mic that gets handed around uh, because we're recording the talk and the, and the Q&A. So wait for the mic before you uh, answer your ask your questions. <clears throat> so it's my honor and pleasure to introduce Elizabeth Wilson. Um, she's the inaugural director of the Arthur L. Irving Institute for Energy and Society and professor of environmental studies at Dartmouth College. Uh, Elizabeth studies how energy systems are changing in the face of new technologies and new societal pressures. Her work focuses on the implementation of energy and environmental policies and law in practice. She's interested in how institutions support and thwart energy system transitions and focuses on the interplays between technology innovation, policy creation, and institutional decision making. She has a PhD from uh, at the Engineering and Public Policy Program at Carnegie Mellon. And I'm personally looking forward to this talk uh, because Elizabeth's interests overlap um, quite a bit with uh, those of the Anlinger Center's Rapid Switch Initiative, which many of you are involved with. Um, but with the title of a talk like Wrong, Wrong, and Badly Wrong, <laughs> Conventional Wisdom in the Energy Sector, I'm sure all of us will find her remarks interesting and provocative. So please join me in welcoming a listener. I want to thank you all for the opportunity to be here. Um, since I've taken over the Irving Institute um, and, and have been trying to build it and get it going two years ago, most of my time is spent writing budget memos. And so having an opportunity to really re-engage with some of the energy space is one that's been incredibly rewarding. So thank you for that opportunity. And the title of this talk is actually what my mother's physics teacher from high school used to say to her when they were working on a tough physics problem and they messed it up. He would say, you are wrong, wrong, and badly wrong. <laughs> And, and as I was looking through my syllabi to get ready to teach this winter, I'm teaching energy environment for the first time at Dartmouth. In my older syllabi, I, I would have weeks on topics that we no longer believe. And, and, and in some ways, I, I, I approach this talk with kind of a, a position of, of, of cultivating um, energy humility in the face of a rapidly changing world. So I've been at Dartmouth now for about two years, and I realize that humility is not a big topic at the Ivies. But, so this is a trigger warning. We're gonna be talking about humility. If you get uncomfortable, just raise your hand. Um, but, but, but this idea that this is a, a really tricky, complex topic, and one that we struggle with you know, across our, our, our careers, and this idea that new ideas and new technologies, some of which make sense, um, are, are ones that, that, that some go early, easy, some go more difficultly, and, and this idea of, of how our systems have changed and will change over time. And, and as an educator, I'm often thinking about this young woman or, or the generation Greta of, of the kids that are coming to us. I'm, I'm blessed right now to have um, a 21-year-old and three teenagers who are regularly telling me that I'm wrong, wrong, and badly wrong. Um, but, but Generation Greta, when she speaks, I hear her anger, but beneath it, I feel her fear. And these are the kids that we're teaching now. These are the kids that don't sleep at night because they're worried about these issues. And so how do we give them tools, maybe better tools than we had, to think about energy system engagement, interaction, and change in their lives going forward? And so the spirit of this talk is thinking about not only what we thought before and how it has shifted, but also trying to look at and understand different frameworks that we may adopt in our, our scholarly practice to engage with some of the serious problems facing society and humanity. And I say this from a position of immense privilege. Um, I mean, if we think about it in the last 10,000 years, this is as good as it's gotten. 
I mean, the energy that we have, the, the buffet that we have, the embedded energy in our bodies, in our lives, in our infrastructure, you know, this is the anomaly. As women, as people of color, this is like the only time in the last 10,000 years that we've actually gotten to play in, in, some, in some areas. Like, I always joke that I'm here because of electricity and birth control. Right? I mean, but, but, but if you just think about the societal um, possibilities that have allowed us to have these conversations and to face these challenges, I, 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 I just want to say that we're doing so at a time that, that is really, really important and really, really privileged. And so while it's a, an incredibly hard challenge, it's also one that we're doing from a place that, um, that is an anomaly. So the false promises um, this is the one we often talk about with nuclear energy being too cheap to meter, the comment made in the, in the, the, the 50s by Louis Strauss. But I, I'm interested in the technology, but I'm also really interested in the system and how the institutions and the supports around technologies evolve over time as well. And so while the too cheap to meter play actually never played out, and those of you who are following the Vogel Project, which is up to $27.5 billion um, today, have seen that. I I'm also interested in the, the surrounding technologies like the Price-Anderson Act, which when first enacted as insurance for the nuclear industry, was a temporary measure for 10 years. It went from 1957 to 1967 with the idea that the industry would be mature enough then to provide its own insurance coverage. It was extended in 66. It was extended in 75. It was extended in 88. It was extended in 2002. It was extended again in 2003. Um, and in 2005. So maybe this temporary policy actually isn't temporary. And this is true of a lot of our energy policies, and we can see it in our, our, our um, accelerated depreciation schedules for new technologies that get locked in. We can see it even in the arguments with the production tax credit or feed-in tariffs. Things that were originally a bridge to help a new idea come um, get locked in to our institutions, our finances, and how we go forward. Um, and so that was just one institutional example. But the thing when I was reading my my, my syllabi that really struck me was the, the, the peak oil story. And I used to have a whole week on, on peak oil when I would teach energy and environmental policy. And the idea being, of course, that we were running out of oil and that it was going to be a horrible thing for society. The number of academic papers and research on the topic was wide ranging. You could find this in the popular journals as well as the more scientific ones. It also became a really important touchstone for popular culture. And I wanna just weave that in here because I think for a lot of our energy discussions at universities, we rest on the economic and the technical with maybe a few policy incentives, but don't necessarily always appreciate unless you're in a communications department about how this changes popular culture. But at this time, you had the emergence of transition towns, season 24 of The Simpsons. This was uh, Homer goes to prep school, where Homer Simpson went and stayed with the preppers of, of, of Springfield, Illinois, to, or Springfield, to uh, deal with the potential uh, shortages of, of fuels and different problems. And then, of course, we know what happened with the real shifts in our stories. And I was talking earlier to Harry about his experience in the gas industry and that evolution over time and how it changed. And, and this diagram, of course, of then fracking becoming um, really important for thinking about the availability of that resource and how that shifted our debates in really important ways. Um, terminals that were being built to import natural gas with a $4 billion investment now being repurposed to, to ship it out. And so now the discussion has shifted not to peak oil, but to peak demand. And this idea of when this country will, will shift and when demand will shift. And when I talk to students about this, I, I really want to contextualize this within a larger story of, of global energy use. I think oftentimes in the, the US, we're guilty of thinking about the two billion of us that have too much power, or the one billion that don't have enough, but not necessarily the four billion people in the middle. 
um, whose energy systems are developing rapidly and driving future energy use, but also future emission, emission trends. And in thinking about that, um, I'd just like us to hold the thought that while we've switched from wood to fossil fuels, we still use as much wood globally. While we're building a lot of renewables, globally we're still using as more than ever fossil fuels. So this idea of energy transitions from a global perspective hasn't been substitutive, but it's been additive. And I don't need to tell this audience that. You guys are the people that put those stories together. But these very basic, you know, BP world energy consumption data with kind of highlighting the fact that low carbon energy is a very, very small picture of the story thus far are helpful for just grounding us in today's energy reality. And I want to go back in this peak oil discussion to some papers written by colleagues Adam Brandt and for those of you who remember Alex Farrell um, that would talk about the, the already consumed fossil fuels and then the much larger resource base and importantly the, the much important carbon implications of that. Their point being, as many of you have made in your work, that we're not running out of fossil fuels, we're running out of atmosphere. Um, so with that story and how it's kind of gone from the wayside, and I don't have a week on peak oil anymore in the syllabus, I, I do like to think about other, other pieces. And, and, and when I started teaching energy and environmental policy, I would also talk about how renewables were too expensive. They're a great idea, but they're way too expensive for prime time. Two, three, 10x the cost of conventional generation. And that's just not true anymore. And so when we think about the, the wind map, for example, I want to give you a case of, of, of something that I've been thinking about a lot over the last couple of years and have written some papers on with a regional transmission organization decision making. We know the wind resources in North America are great. And here's the quiz portion of this talk. So as many of you know, every year the Department of Energy publishes the annual energy outlook. The 1999 annual energy outlook projected different mixes of energy from the year 2000 to the year 2020. Now the base case analysis of this projected that we would build 800 megawatts of wind power, 8,000 megawatts of wind power, 80,000 megawatts of wind power. So each turbine is roughly one to two megawatts. We have about 97,000 megawatts today in the country. How many people think it was A? How many people think it was B, 8,000 megawatts? How many people think it was C, 80,000 megawatts? Okay, the A's have it. <laughs> Right? We, the experts, were wrong by about two orders of magnitude. But why, actually the only people that were right were Greenpeace, but they were right for the wrong reasons. So that's not being right. <laughs> you know, if you do the exam and you write just the answer, you don't get credit because you didn't do the work. Um, so when we're thinking about how these technologies have actually played out, you see the states deploying technologies, um, wind technologies, and in some parts of the country, the percentage of wind is um, in Iowa, in the Dakotas, sometimes up to 30, 40% of their, of their total um, annual consumption. And I don't know how many of you follow the uh, Lawrence Berkeley National Lab Wind Energy Technologies Report. When it comes out every year, it's like the Beaujolais Nouveau, you know? I mean, it's, it's a reason to have a party and celebrate. And so, <laughs> Thinking about, for me, how the story plays out regionally is really salient right now. I mean, in Minnesota, lots of wind. We talked about wind, we built wind. And there was, and you see here, the, the purple being the interior region of the country, that's where most of the wind is going. There were mechanisms to help markets and, and site transmission and help farmers benefit. And it was really seen as something to help rural communities prosper from this energy space. Moving to, to New Hampshire, Vermont, there's a lot of really pretty policies on the book, but people don't seem quite as enthusiastic about actually building infrastructure. 
Um, and so, and when you look at this map, you really appreciate how regionally that makes sense. They haven't been building it. So with wind today at about 20% of new builds, just grounding it in, in our, energy world globe, our energy world nationally, which is still about 50% um, natural gas um, and 20% solar, 20% wind going forward. And again, how that shifts in the interior region, Great Lakes, Northeast, West, and Southeast. So the regional stories that we have around energy um, hide some really important truths about our legacy infrastructure systems, our resource base, our politics, our cultures, and our infrastructure. And so when we're thinking about energy system changes, or we need to think about it in the plural. We have federal incentives and federal policies, but so much of that is happening at the state levels, or as I'll talk to you in just a minute, at the regional transmission levels. So let me take you back to 2007, and I was talking to Jesse earlier. Jesse, where are you? Yeah, <laughs> earlier about um, some of your work in, in Oregon. And at that time, you, in the Midwest, a lot of the governors were passing at that time, very, very aggressive renewable portfolio standards to try and promote wind and renewables in their states. And some of it was actually a little bit comic. In, in Minnesota, for example, we had a Republican governor and the governor of, of Iowa, who was a Democrat, or I'm sorry, of Wisconsin, who was a Democrat, Doyle, didn't want to have the Republicans see more green than he was. And so there was a bit of gamesmanship happening there. But very, very quickly, these governors realized that they would not be able to meet the renewable energy targets unless they also cooperated on transmission. And the, the different times of initiatives to put transmission together resulted in a, um, I think it was a $5.6 billion transmission portfolio across this footprint that developed over the next decade. But a really important player in this was the regional transmission organization, the RTO, MISO, the Mid-Continent Independent System Operator. Now at that time, this bottom red region was not part of MISO. It was only the top um, red region. And what MISO does is essentially market management, long-term planning, and also operations and largely reliability across that footprint. And so one of the challenges once they got the transmission play into the MISO process, and that took about a decade, was how do you integrate a variable resource of wind into the markets? Now, in the, the 2000 annual energy outlook, we had a lot of reasons why wind was 800 megawatts. Um, you couldn't build more than a gigawatt a year. You didn't have transmission access. You couldn't have more than X percent because you would crash the grid. Um, most of these rules that we had locked into our models have pretty much proven not to be true. At the time, they were true. They were part of our conventional wisdom on how the system worked. So in studying how MISO made decisions to integrate wind, we wanted to understand, um, this was an NSF-sponsored project with my colleague Seth Bloomsack at Penn State and Stephanie Lenhart out at Idaho, how their mind shifted, how they changed how they thought about wind before, why they shifted, and, and how they came out with a different solution space. So regional transmission organizations, 70% of wholesale power sold in the US. And while they're voluntary, um, in states like Minnesota, they end up being um, the de facto um, go-to. So starting in 2005, um, wind in the MISO footprint was growing faster than they had anticipated. And it was becoming a problem for the grid operators. When I wanted to curtail somebody down, I had to call you up and say, go off. When I wanted to let you come back, I had to call you again and tell you to come up, right? And, and there were suddenly too much wind. The grid operators needed to make a solution that was automated. You had parallel advances in control systems, in weather monitoring that allowed wind to be dispatchable. And so over the period, a relatively short period, from, from 2009 to 2011, you had the creation of the dispatchable intermittent renewables program, resources program, that allowed wind to participate in the energy markets like any other resource. 
wind bids into the market. And the hack was they allowed it to true up a few minutes before dispatch to avoid the, the control system errors. And one of the interesting things for me in doing this study and talking to the people that made that policy come about was everybody had to think differently about different systems. We had um, colleagues who were working for Windustry, which was a, a wind um, organized or wind focused nonprofit trying to push renewable legislation in different state legislatures. And she realized that to go to the RTOs, she needed to, to speak electrical engineering. So one of the foundations paid for an electrical engineer to come along and be part of those conversations. So a different kind of expertise than she needed to change the laws in the legislature. And so compared to the transmission siting and planning, which took a decade, this was actually really speedy. And, and it allowed wind to be looked at as any other market resource. And MISO's motto was, we are not policy makers, we are policy takers. The states have passed these policies. Our job is just to figure out how to implement. And you had meetings in the market committees, the reliability subcommittees, the planning committees to all make this happen. And then different voting structures throughout. So I know it's happened differently in other RTOs. Um, but, but this process of integration, doing something that before we thought was impossible, involved changes in weather monitoring, changes in control systems, changes in, in the wind technologies itself, but also changes in how the grid operators were able to see and, and, and deal with these different types of systems. So when I'm thinking about how do we teach the future generation of, of people engaged in the energy space. I, I want them to think not only about technologies, but also the societal systems within which they're embedded. Because this problem, as we know, is not solely a technology problem, but one that involves grid operators and lawyers and groups that you may never have heard about before. Um, and so I have three components that I'd like us to think about going forward. The first, which I know is hard, is humility. I mean, maybe it's my halfway point in life. I roughly figure I've got about 100, or I'm sorry, 438,000 hours left in this instantiation. Um, you know, 30,000 of them probably work-related. Um, and, and, and the piece that I think those of you who've had careers in the energy space really have cultivated are how times, circumstances, and opportunities really change throughout your life, and that we're always working to, to make the system work for the context that we have. But I think the second piece is one that, that I'm challenged with in our university structure, where we have our specific departments with our promotion and tenure needs, uh, of being able to think about technologies as embedded in dynamic and co-evolving systems. For, for the wind, it wasn't just the turbine that got better. It was the weather forecasting that changed and the control system that was working with the grid operator and the grid operator who was able to hear those signals and operate the grid accordingly. And other generators on the market were able to respond and adapt in that story too. And then the other piece that I think is so important and so hard for us that want the, the universal solution that will make it all go away or better is that context really does shape possibilities and priorities, and that those contexts change over time. Some of the RTOs that we've studied have superpowers for doing demand management. I would say PGM is probably one of those. Other ones are a lot better at this kind of stuff, and figuring out where those strengths are is, is, is important. So I've been thinking about just trying to leave you with a few of the ways that may help to integrate this into our engineering educations, into our engagement with the humanities and others. How many of you are familiar with transition management, the Dutch school that's out there? Um, Frank Yields and others. Okay, this looks like a mess. I agree with you. Uh, so Frank Yields, has, uh, he's now at Sussex, has really thought a lot about thinking about how new technologies evolve in, in small niches. This was part of a bunch of, of Dutch academics trying to kind of lead 
or think about energy transitions in more systematic ways. And then at the top, you have the, the socio-technical landscape level, our politics, our laws, our societal. And then in the, the middle, the regime. In this case, we'd be thinking about the energy regime and how it goes forward and how it shifts and how new technologies evolve in niches and then maybe they're able to spread. So a lot of people in the history of science have looked, for example, how steamships replace sailing ships or how the spread of different technologies in different contexts happened. Um, I think this is helpful for just the multi-level perspective. You have stuff that's happening on the technology level. You have stuff that's happening in the energy system level. You have larger societal forces like economic meltdowns or uh, geopolitical events that may change what's possible or not possible. I'm a little bit more linear. And with my colleagues, Jenny Stevens and um, Tarla Ray Peterson, we had a socio-political evaluation of energy deployment framework that we've kind of evolved over time. Um, somehow, there it goes. Um, and, and, and for me, this was based on um, Lumen's, Nikolai Lumen's social theory, where his idea was that each of these different societal functions, if you were, has its own internal logic, and that change happens when you have communication across the different logics. Right? So with uh, the wind example that I just gave you, you had change happen when the grid operators started working with the technology developers and they started you know, thinking about the regulatory and legal changes in the marketing department and others to actually make that happen. And so this alignment and communication across these distinctive logics allows our systems to change in different ways. So if you make a technology and it's a great idea, but it's currently illegal, it might be a little harder to deploy. Or it might take a little bit longer, and you'll need to change some other things to let that happen as well. And so thinking about our, our futures as we go forward in more complex ways is something I've been struggling with. And I think one example of, uh, of this, you know, this is one of the great artifacts of the California system. My colleague, Siraj Dopla at Minnesota, you know, when he first saw the duct diagram, he said, yeah, that's what you do if you're a stupid electrical engineer. <laughs> His point being that as an electrical engineer, there were lots of things he could do in terms of engaging with demand, in terms of running his system differently that would avoid the problems there. And I think actually the most interesting thing for me in the duck story, of, you know what this is, right? Does anyone not know what this is? If you, okay. This is the time of day. This is a, a, a figure published by the California Independent System Operator, the grid operator in California. This is megawatts, and then this is the, um, the load and how solar would affect load. So the problem that this presents is, is right here. I mean, the great thing about solar is that when the sun shines, it produces power, but when it's dark, it doesn't. Right? So the idea is California is a, a long, skinny state, and when that sun sets, a lot of your stuff is going offline, and so the ramp is going to be a huge issue that you have to manage. So what you've seen in the California market, what you've seen in, in a lot of other places, are the developing of these demand response products and different ways of thinking about this, ideas and ways to put storage in the system. And I know a lot of people here have a lot of ideas of this but that this is something the grid operator there is actively managing. And it's changing a lot of the conventional wisdom. We used to always think that prices were high as this time of day. Maybe those are shifting. Maybe you want people to do more of their energy use when you have too much power on the system in different ways. So this is an artifact that has changed our way of thinking and brought people together to deal with a problem in different ways, I think is a, a very useful example. And that things we didn't used to think were possible are now pretty commonplace. So I didn't think it would be fair to talk about other systems and how they've changed without having my own predictions. So you can invite me back in five years and tell me I was wrong, wrong, and badly wrong. Um, so in thinking about these, I, I was trying to think in ways that would stretch us all to hopefully have a good conversation and also to hear about your ideas of, of where we think about the world today and where you think, or five or 10 years, it will have flipped. Um, 
My first prediction was that in the future, we will need to talk about mitigation and adaptation simultaneously. I know there's a lot of projects that are talking about reducing CO2. I think in the future, we're going to have to talk about that in concert with adapting to a changing climate. Um, I was at a National Academies meeting a few weeks ago, and they were talking about the water levels in the upper Mississippi, which are, I think Davenport, Iowa, had 220 days at the flood stage this year. Basically, all of the past data we've used to plan and manage those systems is not the future data we're going to have going forward. And a lot of the, the solutions, like an Iowa farmer putting in tile drains in the field to get the water off her field faster, are actually making the problem worse. There's other solutions like cover cropping or other types of things that could potentially make it better, but we have to be engaging um, with the adaptation issue simultaneously. We know two things. If your substation is underwater or on fire, grid reliability goes down, right? I mean, I don't actually think we have a choice in this in the future, and unless we're dealing with this in concert, we're missing a huge opportunity, but one that our students definitely need to be trained in. The other prediction is that the equity and access issues are, are re-emerging as critical. Jesse, you and I were talking about this a little bit, this idea that green energy does not necessarily equate to social justice. And you're seeing in the, the annual, I'm sorry, the, um, the uh, residential energy consumption survey data, 31% of Americans saying they're having trouble paying their energy bills. Now, this isn't because energy is always getting more expensive but it is because we have greater inequalities in our country and because other things like healthcare, like education are getting more expensive and people are more and more and more pinched. This will become the break on the system. You can't go in front of a public utilities commission and tell them you want all these great grid upgrades to deal with the problem. And I think we saw this very, very clearly in France with the Yellow Vest movement. One of my colleagues characterized it as the tension between the end of the world and the end of the month. Right? And so this tension is one that I, I think we, we don't address at our peril because it's one that is driving the pace of decision making in all of these transitions going forward. Um, NAACP has a pretty cool energy justice project looking at these different elements as well. Um, the final prediction, <sighs> Madrid is going on today. Um, Greta will be speaking, and I took the bus down here to see if I could get a low carbon way to get to Princeton. It actually worked pretty well. Um, but we've been focusing on the nation state as the locus for our decision making. There's been enough work now by Heed and others that have focused on the fact that the top 90 companies are 62% of global emissions. And you're seeing more and more lawsuits around the world. I mean, New York, I know, was, was settled yesterday, but you're also seeing a lot of states that are, are, are getting ready to sue for the costs of the adaptation infrastructure. You're even seeing lawsuits by children. And I would posit that this is similar to what tobacco looked like, where it seems crazy until it's not, and that these lawsuits are going to be a big part of our climate and energy discourse over the next decade. They're just starting. But, but I, I expect to be seeing more of this, more of this globally, given the, the now emerging costs of this system going forward. So I just want to leave with three thoughts. The first is, what is often seen as impossible can become possible. And, and we've seen that with renewables coming on the system. We've seen that with with other things that we assumed we could never do that now are routine or managed by algorithms. And I guess the corollary of that is also true. What is possible may remain impossible. A lot of technologies that people have really um, spent a lot of resources studying, whether it's carbon capture and sequestration, that's where Eric and I first met, um, or others remain um, not able to kind of fulfill their promises going forward. But, but I guess right now I would feel as, as part of an energy center at a university, 
we don't really have a choice of whether or not we want to work on this topic because this is the topic facing our generation. This is what our students are demanding. This is what our society needs from us. And whether or not we at the university will be able to engage constructively in this space, I, I think is really still a good question. Um, universities have often been, been strongly criticized for not effectively engaging in, in societal spaces. Um, in the basement of the Dartmouth Library, you guys are all invited there, anyone wants to come, just talk to me. Um, there, there's a whole series of murals by Jose Clemente Orozco about the birth of um, civilization. And uh, this one panel by my 17-year-old son, Charlie, he looked at this panel and he's like, Mom, he's throwing you some shade. And, and, and really, it's Orozco's criticism of the academy, where we have the world burning in the background, academics giving birth to a little skeletal formaldehyde knowledge. Um, and, and one of the reasons why our, 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 our institutions have created energy institutes really is this idea of, of making us socially irrelevant. So I hope we can take that challenge. I hope when we're thinking about the next generation of students, we can engage them meaningfully going forward. And I want to thank you for this opportunity to speak here and not write budget memos for a few hours. So thank you very much. And I want to hear about your favorite changes. OK, so I'm sure you've seen all the projections that we're going to solve all the world's problems with renewables. Mark Jacobs has been out there pitching the 100% renewable by 2050. The Obama administration put in place they wanted 80% from renewable in the year 2011. It's all over the, the all the Democratic candidates did a, a, a pitch on their climate aspirations. And so with Joe Biden was a little bit more nuanced, but almost everybody sort of said, well, of course we have to fix it. We'll do it with wind and solar. Um, your thoughts? I think the world is a big place. Okay, but and, and like, I, I was doing a dramatic pause. <laughs> and, so, and so I want to make sure that the solutions that we are creating and thinking about creating actually fit for where they're being deployed. And in some parts of the world, they may be willing to invest the resources to make those systems come about. In other parts of the world, they probably don't have many other choices. But I think that these conversations are happening in very different ways in very different places. If you were sitting in the middle of Wyoming right now, you would know that question is heresy. How dare you ask it? Because, and, I mean, Wyoming has a lot of, but they have a lot of coal. I mean, I understand every region in the United States, but so the world and every part of the world is different and different parts of the United States are different, but collectively in the United States, uh, you know, my models are way more pessimistic about how far we're going to get with renewables. Yeah, and your I model, and, I and, and, I say, and I in our conversations, I've appreciated that your models are more pessimistic than some of the realities that we're seeing today in like the MISO region. And so, you know, a lot of different pieces are changing here. And, and I mean, the one thing, what, what, what's that great Yogi Berra quote? Like the future is, or wait, prediction is hard, especially when it's about the future. Um, you know, we didn't think that we would be able to have the level of renewables that we have today in the system. And when you look at all of the different things that have changed, um, I, I'm not going to make a prediction of what's going to happen 50 years out. I mean, think about the energy system 50 years ago. Right? We're living. I, 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 guess I, I guess I just want, the, again, it's that cultivation of humility piece. Let's all try it. Um, I, I don't think any of us know how it's going to work out. I, I, I worry more about, um, can I call them energy hardliners? Right? People who know the answer, and their answer is the answer. I mean, at Dartmouth, we have thorium guy that shows up at all the talks, and the answer to all the questions is thorium. 
I mean, maybe you have one of these people here too that has their technology and every time you talk to them, every time you meet them about the coffee machine, they know the answer. So I, I, I guess I'm just, cultivating humility is not a really exciting answer. I appreciate that. But I think it's the only realistic one given the world that we're in today. I will say that we are at a time in this country right now, and Eric and I talked about this a little bit, I don't think we have the appetite to build big infrastructure in America today. When you look at the types of projects that are getting funded, I mean, one nuclear power plant, right, Vogel, I mean, you don't see anyone else queuing up for that. And while I know Rob and I have talked about this a little bit with the infrastructure needs, it doesn't seem to me that our country today is well positioned to do big infrastructure projects. You don't see it anywhere. Um, when I was living in China 2009, 2010, I mean, the level of build, the level of construction happening all the time. They joked that you know, the cranes were the national bird of Shanghai. Um, but, but that's not the stage that our country is in today. And so actually, the, the one other slide that I didn't show is just when we're thinking about these solution sets, you know, we, we often talk about the two billion of us that have too much energy. I have an electric toothbrush. And, or we talk about the people that don't have enough. You know, it's really the four billion people in the middle that, that are driving future energy demand and the shape of the grids and technologies and deployments. And so our engagement with those societies and learning from them, I think, is a really important piece of that story, too. There's a one, two, yeah. Uh, well, uh, as a part of 31% of finding energy bill to be a bit expensive, and the uh, oil peak is not a problem anymore. Uh, and you say I'm that- I'm sorry, you're echoing. Can you well, start? Well, uh, you say that oil peak is not a problem, and 31% people have hard time paying bill, including you know, my family. Uh, don't you think it's, you know, it's not a question that renewables are too expensive. For me, expensive is bad enough. I think one of the goals should be make energy as affordable as possible, because it allows improvement in quality of life. I, I don't understand why should we, you know, impose our social ideas to and make ordinary people, especially in the middle, really pay for them. I think uh, extremely important goal is to make energy as affordable as possible. That's my opinion. At least. Yeah, and 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 for our systems that have and big infrastructure projects are a big part of it. I don't understand why we don't have appetite. I like big infrastructure projects. You know, I, maybe I'm from Soviet Union, for my country, but I do like them. Sorry, I didn't get that last part. Uh, I don't understand the vision why big infrastructure projects are bad. I think it's great, you know, it allows generation of massive amount of power for a very uh, affordable price, and uh, they should be allowed to promote it, at least in my opinion. Okay, I'm sorry I didn't quite get the sorry question. No, 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 it's a sound system that actually is a little tricky. Um, one of the pieces that, you know, technologies that make sense, I mentioned nuclear, but another one that makes a lot of sense that we don't actually do very well is energy efficiency, which makes energy a lot more affordable, but actually doing it has huge transaction costs. And so in, in getting the level of energy efficiency that we actually could potentially get, the promise has been there for decades, but actually achieving that promise in our buildings is really boring. It means you have building inspectors and it means you have codes. And when you look at places that do energy efficiency well, like Germany, even they struggle with getting the level that they need to meet some of the goals they have in their societies. And other places are, are even more challenged. So, yeah, I think I had one here. And oh yeah, Lynn. I have the Lynn. microphone. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Elizabeth, for properly contextualizing the challenge and the complexities of, of what we're facing. So, so I really enjoyed that. Um, I, I would generally agree with your predictions, except I would challenge you on the analogy that you drew with tobacco. Because I feel like, you know, with tobacco, it's an option to not smoke. With energy, it's not an option not to use energy. And Michael here just said, if you smoke, you die. If you don't use energy, you die. So it's not aligned, right? And yeah, so yeah, yeah, that's a good point. How do we think about I guess I was ahead because I mean these analogies they sort of work but they don't really work because we depend on it. we're our own worst enemies essentially right so I mean, with the tobacco analogy this is from my friend Alex Glass who's actually working with the um, 
lawsuit in, I mean, Minnesota has very strong consumer protection laws. And the idea with the tobacco analogy was you're using the same consumer protection standards to go after some of the big fossil fuel industries. So it's not like you smoke, you use energy. It's that these statutes that are there to protect consumers can also be used to protect consumers because of these organizations' activities. But you're protecting consumers from consumers. You're protecting consumers from fossil fuel companies that haven't been honest or accountable with the dealings of their wares. I mean, I'm happy to send you some of the argumentation. It's, it's something that I, I'm not sure I 100% believe it, but I know it's heating up. And I, I, I feel like tobacco that the lawsuits that started kept going. When you see how Exxon is behaving, they're going and forward and suing a lot of the state attorney generals because they don't want to go forward. And so they're actually being very aggressive on this. And I think they're being aggressive because they're afraid. So, so I'm just seeing the behaviors, the legal behaviors and the, and the signaling. And I would like to add to, you know, I, I wrote this talk while I was reading Dark Money. How many of you guys have read Dark Money? It is not a cheerful holiday book, but, but it does talk about how a lot of our climate and energy discussions have been fueled by interest groups posing as you know, the uh, social organizations. And you're seeing it now in the electric grid space. There's an organization called Save Our Grid um, that's being funded again as a, 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 as a lobbying group in this story as well. So like, the, the, it's not as if we're having an argument where everyone is analytically honest and, 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 and straight dealing. There's a lot of other stuff happening here and understanding the topography of those money flows and the politics of this situation is equally important as to understanding the technologies for understanding system change. So I, I, there was, do you wanna just yell it? This is a bit of a follow-up to that question. Can you talk about what you imagine pressure on the high carbon companies looking like? Are you imagining that it would come from consumers who are you know, using energy in everyday life or from government? Um, and, and how you imagine that, that transition happening with those companies? You know, this is an area, I mean, I, I'm sure there's a lot of other law professors and, and others actually not here at Princeton because you don't have a law school. Um, but who are engaging in this topic. I'm not an expert here. It's one of those issues that I've started to see, and what you're seeing today are, you know, the New York attorney, the New York lawsuit under the, um, that just got solved yesterday with ExxonMobil. There's a lot of the state attorney generals suing for adaptation climate damages that their states are now facing due to climate change. Um, California's one, a lot of the states with stronger consumer protection laws. And then there's a whole suite of lawsuits brought by children that are kind of blaming the fossil fuel companies for compromising their future. I don't know if this will work, who knows? But I also know that when we first started talking about tobacco or even opioids, maybe it's better to think about energy as an opioid. No, no, you're not, you're not thinking about it as an analogy, you're thinking about it as a consumer protection standard. But you, you could be right. I mean, I just think that we're going to see more of this, not less. So in five years, come tell me I was wrong, and we can figure out how they did it. I don't know if I agree with me. I just was trying to be provocative so we'd have a good discussion. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. Hi. Uh, so you've been talking about how this is all a combination of technology, policy, and economics. And and culture. And, and I want culture. to make sure we talk about the other there stuff, too. There were six pillars or whatever. Uh, so assuming technology is the same across the United States, more or less, what, if you can say quickly, why do we see so much use of renewables in the MISO region, whereas places like New England and California that we would expect would be more gung-ho or lagging? Yeah, so first of all, just so in the future, so miso is soup that you drink in Carmel, Cal no, no, soup that you drink in Carmel, California, and miso is the grid operator in Carmel, Indiana. It took me a long time, and I just think about, okay, soup, miso, soup, get Carmel, Carmel. <laughs> and, um, and this is actually really interesting for me, the state-by-state -state differences and what you see is actual deployment. We had a project with Jenny Stevens and Tarla Ray Peterson back in 2007 looking at wind technologies. I, I was working on CCS at the time, and what I really appreciated was every place you went to thought about the technologies very, very differently. And at that time, natural gas prices were high, 
And you know, you had policies, especially in in uh, Massachusetts and some in Minnesota, promoting wind. Not so much in Texas, but you had a huge deployment in Texas. So we went and we started interviewing people who were part of that policy making process. You know, why here? Why not there? We looked at Montana as well. And what was interesting to me is that the technology is actually quite different. Um, in, in, in terms of not the, not the physical technology, but how it operates, and importantly, number six, how it's perceived. Um, we did a newspaper analysis, and at that time, 50% of the articles on wind in the Star Tribune were on the front page. It was sold as a human interest story. It was a story that was going to help failing Midwestern farms earn additional sources of revenue and be successful into the future. In Texas, 75% of the articles were in the, the business section of the Houston Cron. At that time in Texas, gas was on the margin. It was really expensive. We're an energy state. We do wind. Right? And, it was so, and, and, and we even had some great quotes of, you know, in Texas, you don't show up at the legislature with your bead-wearing, hippie environmentalist. You know, we're business people. We do energy. And then in Massachusetts, on the book, the laws were beautiful. Most of the articles were about Cape Wind. I mean, New England likes to talk about infrastructure. They're not quite as into building it. And you could argue because of population densities. You could argue because they're too rich. You could argue all kinds of things. But you had really different ways the technologies were perceived in different places. Now, one of the things that's been interesting for me in some of our work on solar, we have a project right now funded by the McKnight Foundation with my colleague Gabe Chan at Minnesota and Stephanie Lenhardt again, looking at municipal utilities and co-ops, so some of the most coal-intensive utilities in the country. And what we've appreciated is these are consumer-owned organizations or you know, town-owned organizations. And there's often a real resistance to rooftop solar, especially in the co-ops, because it's seen as taking away from our collective. But if they start doing community solar that they own and you buy into, they can be incredibly receptive to it. So that configuration of the technology also can reduce some of the political resistance in these different organizations. And I hadn't appreciated that before. I thought solar PV. I thought utility scale or community scale. But I didn't realize that one would be so much um, more allergic to some of these consumer-owned utilities. So. I uh, have a little bit of a trouble uh, with the way I've heard you talk. It seems to me that, I guess it's almost in the cultural, one has not taken into account what I would call a per capita uh, issue, uh, which must cover this whole energy thing. And it seems you've talked a lot about how to deal with it locally, but mm -hmm. we always blame the Chinese, but they're well, a factor of 10 better than we are per capita. Uh, the other thing is the time constant. Um, I was looking at a picture this morning that I found on the internet <laughs> that was drawn by human beings or their precursors 44,000 years ago, and presumably we would like to go 44,000 years into the future. And again, it's, it's very difficult to get from what you have said. I can see doing it in, you know, what's going to happen in mm -hmm. 20 years, mm -hmm. maybe 40 years. But where have we really got to get to on a time scale of that order? Um, if we look back in the ice core data, we find cyclic behaviors of the climate. Does that alter how we have to think? And I'm not trying to suggest you don't understand or haven't thought about these, but you didn't tell me anything about them today, and I, I thought that that underpinned a lot of what you were thinking about. So I really appreciate your comment on the per capita. When I was living in China, one of the things that often struck me, I, I was there working on CCS stuff, um, and the Americans would come in and they would talk about the need for CCS, and they would show the US at that time and Chinese emissions about the same. 
And then the, our Chinese colleague would get up and he would, sh or she would show the US emissions per capita and the Chinese emissions per capita. And, and this repeated itself with the Europeans, with the, with the Australians. And, and when I'm working with students, I often talk to them about the moral valence of how we decide to show our data. If it's in today's emissions, if it's in historical emissions, and what that means for the, the responsibility perceived and otherwise into who was responsible to pay for future actions, to deal with the consequences. Um, in dealing with that in the US, um, you can argue that the grid in North Dakota is four times as carbon intensive as that in California. And that if Californians really cared about emissions, they would be doing energy efficiency in Fargo. Um, but that's not how our political systems are, are set up to actually deal with any infrastructure or problems. And the logics in these different places are my time scale. I'm not thinking about geologic time. I'm not thinking about the time of human history on the planet, more the time that public utility commissions are making decisions that are setting us on the course uh, for our next energy decades. And so if that's the time frame of in, and in Eric, your, your conversation that we had last night of, you know, with all of these scenarios you're looking at, the next 10 years actually are pretty consistent across all of them. I mean, we're at a critical point in the right direction. Ding. Exactly. Because but but what and what I've really appreciated is that one of the best ways in any legislative system to, to slow or kill something is to run it through as many committees as possible. I mean, those of us who are trying to get courses, multidisciplinary courses approved at, at our colleges know this, right? Um, but 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 that's what happens with climate change. And that's what's happened with climate change consistently. And my only one reservation about putting mitigation and adaptation must be together is that it's a heck of a lot more committees. But I don't think we have a choice because when your substation's underwater, we have a problem. And it is underwater in lots of parts of the world. And so, well, and it's, well, and one of the more interesting pieces of analysis that, that, that a colleague at NOAA was showing me was the projected um, models of, of rainfall or drought and how they were actually comparing to real data. And that there's lots of places in the world where we were wrong, wrong, and badly wrong <laughs> in, in our projections. And so that upper Mississippi flood zone or the or the um, other parts of the Rio Grande or other parts of the world where we're having droughts and fires, I think kind of show us that this interplay between human and natural systems is one that actually has to be reckoned on a much shorter scale than the geologic. So I will take that as a friendly amendment to uh, thinking about the natural systems more explicitly. Thank you. So is that, was that the, we're done I think, I, in the I back? Think I think we're gonna have to wrap up. Yeah, now. yeah. Um, but I just wanna point out that I predicted this would be interesting and provocative and it was. <laughs> Thank you very much, Elizabeth. Thanks, you guys.